one morning, thank you for uh, letting me come over and cross some of the river here from over in Iowa. Uh, being from Iowa, you know, everything I shared today about Soul House, it won't work here. I will just start right from the very beginning. Okay, so don't bother taking notes. Don't bother with all of it, right? It won't work here. Just put that out there from the very beginning. No, I'm just kidding. It's all about context, right? And everything I'm going to share today, echoing off of what Keith teed up here this morning, and it, it is awesome talk. Keep everything into the context for your operation. I'm going to talk about ethanol today. We're going to talk about carbon intensity. We're going to talk about soil health principles, but context for how you can take some of these ideas and implement them for your operation. That's really the key. Same thing as we talked with the farmer panel here this afternoon, context and just taking a couple of nuggets that you can implement to your operation. That's really what this is all about as we listen to presenters and we interact with other farmers here today. It's all about factoring in that context for your operation. Uh, like in my intro, uh, I'm a farmer myself. My family farm is over in Southeast Iowa, take AD all the way across to Iowa City. Uh, the farm is about 25 minutes south of there, 25 miles south of there in Washington. And uh, we farm about 700 acres, corn soybean operation, I farm the bike with my parents. Uh, we've been using no-till since 1978. We've been cover cropping since 2013. And really seeing these things play out that Keith was talking about, being able to really see that soil get built out, that system really thrive and function. And that's what makes me excited about speaking with you guys today and makes me excited about going and, and building companies, getting more farmers involved, that this stuff really works. And we're seeing it on our own farm. And I'm gonna share some of that data here today. You guys have stuck with me for a long time here today. I don't know how they must not have been able to uh, add a different speed or back out or something. I don't know how you guys get stuck in there for all the time, but I'm excited because there is a lot to share. To anytime you got questions, just shout it out. And uh, I'll repeat it for the rest of the audience and stuff. Okay, so so uh, just shout it out or, or wave me down. Happy to take some questions for us, which we got a lot of good time here today. Um, I do have a couple of little kids. I have a part of the eighth generation on our family farm. And as we think about building soil health, we got to be thinking about those future generations, right? Regenerate that soil to make it better than how we found it. And uh, being that we've learned in Iowa from this last 250 years, we've got to continue to build up that soil, be more profitable, farm in Mother Nature's image, and be setting ourselves up for future success. Started a company in 2015, as as in my intro, um, just to, eh, trying to help build off of what we've done on our own farm. Number one takeaway for today is you've got to continue to figure out how to implement those principles of soil health, mimicking Mother Nature, getting that carbon economy going that Keith was talking about. That's really, really critical. There's opportunities for some outside money coming I mean, in for this. There's different state programs you all have, but what I'm gonna share about is some of these federal initiatives that are going on specifically around carbon intensity, but no matter what, it all takes data. It takes data if we want to better understand our soils, better understand our agricultural system to be able to make better agronomic decisions. It takes data if we want to comply with some of these different regulated spaces, it takes data to position ourselves to put some dollars in our pocket and some of these marketplace initiatives, sustainability programs, carbon initiatives, those kind of things. It takes the data. We've got to focus on organizing our system, utilizing that data, put some dollars in our pocket. Putting in all the soil health principles and just kind of my take on them, again, building off of what Keith shared here this morning. Uh, some of the context on, on cool. what we have seen on our own farm. So we're going to go through just some quick details on each of these and just some ideas on you know what we're seeing and uh, hopefully that you guys are starting to really see happen on your operations as well. But as we look at these soil health principles, I think the most important thing, the biggest takeaway is as you think about improving your operation here in the 2024 season, We've got to think about these systems as offensive management tools rather than as defensive tools. So what do I mean by that? I think these principles have been kind of marketed incorrectly, in my opinion. They've been marketed as implement, you know, no-till or cover crops, some of these things to defend against erosion, defend against water quality problems, defend against impeding regulations. And that's fine, but it's hard for us in our 
firmer brains to put that directly to economics in the bottom line. In terms of quantifying dollars of soil saved or quantify that risk mitigation, right? In terms of dollars. How I like to look at these principles is they're offensive management tools. If I get that cover crop done correctly, if I manage my residue correctly with no-till or a reduced till, strip till type of program, if I manage these systems correctly, they can directly put dollars back in my pocket because they're part of my offensive program, just like that seed or that fertilizer or that other crop input. That cover crop is part of my nutrient stabilizer program, part of my fertilizer program, part of my pesticide program, part of my moisture management program, and now part of carbon into the soil to feed that entire system, but also to create some of these off the farm opportunities here as well. So a little bit of details on that. Start with reducing that chemical and physical disturbance, not dis not disturbing that soil microbial system that we were just talking about. I think we think about this a lot as hey, reducing tillage, but it's also about reducing some of our synthetic inputs some of our pesticides too. Mother Nature wants osmosis, right? Wants equilibrium, wants consistency. And any time that we throw that system out of whack, we're causing change and fluctuation in the soil. So it's about reducing some of that disturbance. Same thing for our own bodies, right? You're supposed to eat healthy kids day to day. You don't want to throw your system out of whack. On our farm, by building up that soil microbial system, building up the function, the symbiotic relationship between those microbes and those plants, we've been able to decrease our need to supplement. On our farm, we've seen that we've reduced our nitrogen from about 230 units of nitrogen like corn to about 155 units, because that soil is building it on its own. Those micro, microbial communities are pulling that nitrogen from the atmosphere, building up that organic nitrogen in the soil. We don't have to supplement this bunch. But phosphorus as well, we really reduced our phosphorus down because it's becoming more freely available in the soil. Like Keith was sharing, these nutrients, a lot of times we apply them and they get super tightly locked up in our soils. But over time, we could get that microbial system to function better, get that flywheel to spin faster, but reduce our need for inputs. And we can still screw the plier, we're still going for big yields here, right? But reducing our inputs, allowing the natural system to do it on its own. So potash is one of the things we completely got rid of. I think we're seven, eight years now, zero potash. Potash is potassium chloride. Right, and that chloride, that chlorine get built up in that soils. I think over time, I'm just hurting some of our ability to build up those microbial populations. We've done some potassium sulfate, but zero potash. Um, by balancing that soil, Keith talked about it too, build up that carbon, it helps to balance the soil pH as well. Now you might need to fix it at the beginning, right? If you're way out of whack, but over time, we're finding by not throwing the system out of whack, throwing that chemical balance out of whack, we don't have to. A lot of time, uh, we have a lady line like Glenn and Plum years now. We've literally got rid of residuals. I think utilizing that cover crop to suppress those weeds later in the season basically one places that residual. Some of these plants are exuding exudates out there that chemically deter weeds from germinating, but also keeping that soil covered, keeping other living roots out there, keeps those weeds from coming. Produce our insects a big time too. Keep the talking about bricks a little bit. We've been experimental with sugars. Take about a half a pound of sugar diluted with water in different applications, split applications throughout the year, building up the bricks levels. I think there's a huge opportunity for our farm to take that even further. Um, but letting the plants be healthier on their own so they're less susceptible to disease and insects. Um, no, it's 95% because if we have a problem, then we're behind the eight ball and the plants aren't built up the way that we want them to we go and spray let's fight another day but we know that we're killing a lot of good guys along the way so we're trying to decrease that as much as we can it's something on the fun side it's trying to utilize more nutrient and less fun side building up the plant health with diverse micronutrient compounds things like that getting the plant to interact with the soil rather than us having to fight disease Building up some of that soil too, you can see a little bit of fun. Some of those white hyphen strands that we're seeing in some of our soils too. It takes a couple of years, 
but I really think we can get there, build this system up. One of the coolest things that we've seen get built on our farm is our ability to infiltrate water. Across the country, the average water infiltration rate is about a half of an inch of infiltration per hour. Oh, and you can test this, right? Dear different NRCS offices and stuff. Usually they've got water infiltration test kits and things. Definitely something to uh, to experiment with sometime. But seeing that rather than be at the national average of only half an inch of water, water infiltration per hour, we're seeing infiltration like this where we can take it a one inch rainfall in six seconds. And they total take in four inches of rainfall in under five minutes. We haven't had to replant any crop. I think we're going six years of zero replant now. And we've uh, no crop insurance payments, anything like that. We're able to get that water into the soil when we get rains, hold on to it in that poor space, hold on to it, like building up that organic matter, every 1% organic matter in some like 26,000 gallons of water. So building that system up, able to really help us to be more resilient against too much rain, resilient against not enough rain, make our plants happier throughout the year. What's really cool, why I love this picture on this giant earthworm channel, is you can kind of see along the, the earthworm channel at the bottom, I got this fancy clicker. I figure out how's this similar. Here we go. Look at that. So see that kind of clay, orange colored material in that in that uh, nice black soil. That clay material is subsoil deposits, B horizon deposits. We're seeing the earthworms mixing our soil. Our topsoil, our A horizon, is more than two two and a half foot deep where we dug this soil. We're seeing the clay material from about three foot deep in the soil being deposited right up near the soil surface. And we've done some meter deep soil sample with Colorado State and see that we've got black soil, high organic matter deposits down at the bottom of those meter deep samples. And I'm sure there's wires, those root channels taking it even deeper than that. But really interesting to see some of that mixing, right? As we think about a no till system and worried about stratification of nutrients, of course we're going to have stratification of nutrients, but those worms and that natural system is going to really help mix for us and allowing that system to take its time. Really, really cool to see that start happening. We're seeing this really consistently as well, but really cool to see. So as we think about minimizing that disturbance, not throwing the system out of whack, we also got to protect from the top down, of course, keep that armor on the soil. It's I'm sure some of you guys from microbial system is cranking, right? right? When we get those microbes really going, get those earthworm populations built up, now we got to keep feeding the beast. They're hungry. We got a lot of microbes out there. So what we've had to do is get even more aggressive with planting green and delaying termination, going higher seed egg ratio mixes even ahead of corn, like in this system, and letting that residue build up so that we don't have bare soils by June free to fly. Utilizing that soil armor to protect against that impact of rainfall, use that armor to suppress weeds, use that armor to lock in moisture. We've played around a little bit with some roller crimping. Or definitely an opportunity, I think. Uh, so plenty of farms. Uh, where, how we've done on our farm is we plant cereal rye in the fall into the corn stalks. Um, if you're crimping, you got to be a little bit heavier weight than if you're not. Um, the cereal rye works well. In my system here, you can see we've experimented with the crimping just a little bit. And um, what we did was we planted the rye, into, or planted the soybeans into the rye when it was small. And then you can wait, and when the swimmings are between V1 and V3, they're flexible enough, you can actually crimp all over the top of those growing soybeans. You talk about freaking dead out. Out, out, you get freaking out. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, it's two acres, and we actually did this on my farm. And they're like, you have Rick Clark does it. Imagine. <laughs> but uh, so we, we took the uh, crimper out there, that uh, borrowed it from a neighbor, Levi, Levi Lyle, and uh, we had the crimper out there. The problem in our system being in a, in a chemistry um, system where we're typically terminating our cover crop with chemistry, we don't plant our cover crop super thick, right? So I think a soybean three is with that 45 to 60 pounds of cereal rind. Uh, we're planting it early enough that we can get good tillering, get good growth. The later you wait into the year, the heavier weight that uh, they'll be go because you're not going to get as much biomass built up without fall tillering, right? And so. Earlier in the season, we go light rates of, of cover as far as early planting, like early October, like September, we'll go lighter rates of cover, build that up over time. But we wanted to experiment with this roller cripping thing. 
So we planted the soybeans, drilled them in to cereal rye, and, uh, and cranked what those beans were about V2. And uh, because those beans are yeah, between V1 and V3, they're just flexible enough that they'll fall down a little bit, or pop back up. If they are too young and too brittle, right? That cotton, if uh, the beans are too little, they're brittle, you run over and they just snap, and they're snapping below the ground before they're done, right? Just like if you get hail too early in the year and KO the soybeans. But if they're too big, if they're beyond V3, that's where you see them get bruised up a little too much, they're a little bit too big. They don't take that crimper super well. But in this system, we crimped over the top of that rye. Because it was light rates of rye, we ended up actually crimping it both directions. We crimped it one direction, didn't lay down perfectly, so we came back and crimped it the other direction. So we actually ran over this twice. And the yield between where we did not use the crimper versus in the crimper was about one bushel yield difference. They were both like 72 bushel yield, no fertilizer, no seed treatment, no method on it. Um, and we reduced, of course, the passive herbicide where I used the crimper and uh, still maintained really awesome yield. So for some of you guys that are looking to really cut back on, on some of the pesticides, but want to really keep maintaining big yield by planting soybeans early, using fuller season soybeans, I think this can be a, an opportunity. Keeping that armor on, like I said, maintaining that moisture drop the year, trafficability, just protecting some of that impact of our, of our plants uh, impacting the system. One of the things uh, that we've watched is, you know, being able to avoid erosion, right? We do want to keep our soils where they are. We don't want to be losing that, uh, that soil. One of the things that we've done to monitor and make sure that we aren't mining our soil over time by decreasing all these nutrients is we've done a little bit of the cold nutrient digest test. Um, so if one of those things, if your neighbors are saying, oh, you're going to mine your soil, cut all those inputs, right? Or um, you want to see how much nutrient you actually have available in your soil. I like using the, the total nutrient digest test. We've only done it a little bit. It's not something that you do all the time. But it's one of those things that, um, if you want a little bit of data, kind of interesting. In our soils, this was, uh, I believe, a six inch sample. Let's see here. Here in my fancy deal. Six inch sample. And uh, in the top six inches here, we've got 50,000 pounds of carbon, 4,000 pounds of nitrogen, 400 pounds of phosphorus. 1,700 pounds of potassium, 6,200 pounds of calcium, and so on and so forth. Crazy amount of these nutrients there in just the top six inches. <laughs> but like Youth was talking about, a lot of times these nutrients just aren't necessarily readily available and not plants available. We gotta keep the microbes to actually help to unlock these nutrients. And we did some of this testing because we wanted to see, make sure that we're not losing our nutrients over time. As a seventh generation farmer, I want to make sure that's there for the next seven generations. We're cutting back on our inputs because don't think we need them. We're not seeing the response to uh, the fertilizer. We think our microbes are doing it on their own, but having some of this data really helps to prove to us we're going to monitor this every five, 10 years. You know, We want to make sure that we aren't mining our soil slowly over time. I'm really confident that that soil mixing is going to continue to help us um, live on for a long, long time even though we are cutting some of those fertilizers coming from off the farm, but we're utilizing that depth of soil profile to, you know, but just making it more available. Use the Haney test to quantify what is plant available. Um, I like using that to be able to see what's readily available in, the, in my soil. This is kind of like the vault, right? This is with total potential. We just need to unlock and by using that Haney test shows us what is readily available. One of the big things on soil armor, I think this one really pertinent to you guys out here, but we're gonna keep that soil from getting too hot, too dry, burning up our microbial communities in summer. This is what most of our farms look like after we terminate our cereal rye. This is a soybean field. If I took this picture on like June 15th, the soybeans were about knee high. Soybeans would be planted in April. Uh, we would have sprayed this cover crop when it was headed out, it's probably 10, 12,000 pounds of biomass out there. And uh, so that cereal rye was just starting to drop pollen. We went out there with the shot herbicide, terminating that cover crop. This is about two weeks later. Now then brown, dying down with those beans. Like I said, they're about knee high in there. So I was holding this, my camera up, took this picture. That day was 91 degrees upside, middle of June, plenty hot day. At the top of that cover, because it was 
burned up. The land on right, it was just radiating heat back off of that. It was hot out there. I was playing around with the thermometer that day, 91 degrees outside, 100 degrees at the top of that canopy, where it's radiating heat back off. Then I took the thermometer down to where the soybeans were, right on the soil surface. That soil was 76 degrees. Perfect. Sunny and 75, like it is every day in Iowa. It was yesterday, but I, you know, like, this said, I hope my wife thought it's trapped over here. I'm like, has the weather hit there yet? I've spoken at three different talks yesterday on my drive here. And uh, I was at one, and it was super nice. I walked in with uh, just a, a, a polo on, just t shirt, walk out. I'm like, gosh, dang, it's cold out here. It was nice when I got in. I called my wife. And I was like, yeah, is it hit yeah, She's like, oh, it's beautiful. It's like 77 degrees, sunny in southeast. Sunny. I'm like, it's like 45 mile an hour winds and 19 degrees here in Nebraska. That's it. And I'm like, can I actually, you know. Anyway, always 70 and 75 in Iowa. That's the moral of that story. So again, it doesn't work. <laughs> this doesn't work here. It doesn't look a lot. Like, uh, but hey. Um, so 76 degrees down at that soil surface, perfect temperature, right? Just what the micros want, just what the soybeans want, hot day. Then I tested some of the bare soil out on the side of the field that didn't have residue on it, 126 degrees. So if we were planting, you know, 30 inch row soybeans, didn't have to cover, if we had all that bare soil, that would have been about 126 degrees as well. Just burned it out of, we're frying some of those microbes at that time, we're evaporating moisture out like crazy. That soil system is really shutting down. So we've got to keep that those plants healthy. I think using that bar burn as an offensive tool can really help. Now I get it. We're in Nebraska again. This stuff doesn't work here, right? Because don't get rain, right? So the key on that is if we got wet spoke soils in the spring, if we got some rain coming, let that cover crop keep alive. We're using irrigation pivot. Let that cover and your cash crop continue to grow together especially rye soybeans. We got the grass and the bean that grow together, really forces that system to work, utilize that high carbon to nitrogen ratio to make our beans work harder for us. If we've got the moisture, let them keep on growing. It's kind of like a companion crop. When it gets hot and dry, when you're ready to get that cover killed, go out there and spray it based on the soil moisture and based on the weather. Then that soil, then that armor falls back down We'll lock in the moisture that we've got. Again, it's an offensive management tool. If wet in the spring, let the cuts start keep alive because now we're helping to dry out the soil, prepare the seam bed, not just with evaporation, drying off the soil surface, but with transpiration as well. Pulling nutrients, pulling water from deeper in that soil surface, letting those plants transpire the moisture back out in the atmosphere, keeping our plants happy, especially the soybeans. So we're planting soybeans earlier and earlier into the cereal rye. Soybeans don't like cold, wet feet, but by growing the beans and the rye together, are able to do this plant beans really early, super full season beans to go after big yields and still able to do it with no seed treatments and avoiding that uh, seedling disease. But it's letting those crops work its symbiosis together. May team of that soil armor, let those, especially some of those fungal communities that, that Keith was talking about, they are really fragile, right? Really fragile filamental systems. They take a while to really build up. Bacteria can respond very quickly, but some of these more complex microorganisms like fungi, protozoa, nematodes, some of these other beneficials, they take a little bit more time to build up those communities. We've got to keep that armor around there for them. Keith laid it out way better than what I ever could hope to. But it's those living roots pulling that photos, pulling that carbon from the atmosphere, utilizing that sunlight energy. That's the dry work of the whole system. We've got to maintain living roots on there as much as we possibly can. I think the biggest gains we're going to get is in the spring. Be patient, plant green, let that cover crop get out there, let that cover crop go, let that cover crop take off. Be patient, especially on soybeans being planted green into the cereal rye. That's really the easiest opportunity there. Um, in that small, you know, call it 12 inch cereal rye, usually tied up about 25 units of nitrogen. So if you're planting green with corn, I'll like supplement a little bit of nitrogen leaving out a little bit going on. In furrow, when we terminate our cover crop for corn, we use a little bit of 32% with the herbicide, three to four gallons of 32%. Seed that up just a little bit. 
get a little bit of nitrogen out there to balance out that carbon to nitrogen ratio. But uh, what we're seeing is after termination, of course, we're getting the nutrients to release back. We've got some really interesting data. I won't share it today, but we've been doing any test weekly for the last six years on farming. Weekly soil sampling. I guess interns that go out of pull some soil samples. You have to share. They're out there all the time, over and over and over from the same spots. But seeing the difference between what happens with a cover crop versus without a cover crop, how are we tying the nutrients? And then when do those nutrients get released? That cover crop is fertilizer and the nutrient stabilizer. And I can manage that correctly and get those nutrients unlocked out of my soil, mm -hmm. terminate the cover crop, and let it site dress my crop for me slowly over time. Maintaining those living roots, of course, is how we've got to build up our carbon and stuff too. I'm going to explain some of these carbon programs, although we're going to get there, right? But getting that carbon locked into the soil is really the whole driver of the system. The driver for us producing yield, seeing those microbes, all that good stuff, but also our ability to be more resilient over time to help a lot of these corporations meet some of their carbon and sustainability goals. It's getting that carbon into our soils. One of the farmers that we work with, long time cover crop or um, had a research trial going on. That was 10 years of just no-till versus 10 years of no-till with cover crops. And this is that picture. So on the left-hand side, of course, left-hand side here is just with no-till, pretty good structure, probably four, four and a half percent organic matter. Good stuff, right? Awesome. But on the right was just with added the cover crops. You can see more of that crumb structure in the air. And uh, this, the color difference, of course, being massive. These soils were 30 foot apart. It's the same stuff, 30 foot apart. And uh, part of that color, of course, you can see the moisture that's holding on to. So the big thing in that color difference with that organic matter in there, holding on to more moisture. Of course, we all know your benefits of building up organic matter, but in carbon talk, think of building up our soil organic carbon like building up that organic matter. Organic matter on average is 58% carbon. Okay, so as we want to sequester this carbon and work within these carbon markets and stuff, it's about getting that soil organic carbon built up. Organic matter is 58% carbon. So as we build organic matter, we're building this soil organic carbon. So I would build organic matter. Organic matter is 90% microbial necromax, dead microbes, microbial carcasses, microbial necromax. It's kind of a fun, fun word. I don't think I have one on there. Oh, no, I do. I must have Googled it sometime and figured out how to spell it. That's shaking me. It's how many. That's a living hell out thing. But 90% uh, microbial necromass. So if we want to build carbon, you got to build organic matter. If we want to build organic matter, we're going to build organic oh, microbial necromass. Dead microbes, if we want to build dead microbes, you got to have more alive microbes. If we want alive microbes, we got to have carbon going down into that soil, which is what the microbes eat, right? That liquid carbon, that simple sugar they keep talking about. We got the floral or soon for those microbes, you have more living plants. The plants are the driver of the entire thing, building up that carbon over time, getting more of that down into the ground we feed our microbes. I really think we got to get aggressive on this one here too. Keith shared the atmosphere is a small percent carbon, and with all these companies trying to lower that CO2 from the atmosphere, and we need to make sure that we have the carbon in our soils, and there's going to be less and less of it in the atmosphere if these companies can succeed in meeting our goals and lock this carbon in holes in the ground and in the ocean and all these different things. According to Dr. Jerry Hatfield, as long as we have water, the most limiting element to yield is carbon. We said that again. So already today, our most limiting element to yield, as long as we have water, is carbon. So already today, our plants could produce more if they add more carbon. Their plants are pulling a lot of that carbon out of the atmosphere, right? But really, God put the stomata on the underside of the leaf where the plant takes in the carbon. God put it on the bottom side of the leaf because the plants are supposed to get their carbon from the soil. Microbes slowly perspiring out that carbon, releasing that carbon so the plant can capture it. The plant can convert that carbon back into simple sugar with photosynthesis. The plant can pull most of that carbon back in the ground via those plant redexates to feed those microbes, keep that carbon down here in cycles. As we grow up bigger barriers yield, we don't pull a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. 
should be able to get them done, right? If there's going to be less and less of that carbon in the atmosphere, we want to feed 10 billion people and continue to grow big yields and be profitable. If we have less carbon in the atmosphere, we better be covering sure we got ample carbon in the so we can continue to be profitable, continue to be competitive over the long haul. So I really think we got to focus on this, not just because it makes agronomic sense, but also in the macroeconomic world here of decarbonizing the atmosphere, we really got to make sure we get that soil on the ground. One of the things that could happen, I think we're a long way from it, but one of the things that could happen is if we don't have as much carbon in the atmosphere anymore, we can have some long-term detriment. One of the things that I refer to is in the 90s, there's the Clean Air Act, which aimed to clean up all the sulfur and stuff out of the atmosphere. For that, it didn't really have to apply sulfur, right? We got all the sulfur from acid rain from the atmosphere. Today, what we do, we apply sulfur. Sulfur is very mobile. It's not the only reason, of course, but same thing maybe could happen in the future. I think we're a long ways from it, but I don't know, just something I think about. I think too much, I drive too much, I think feel kind of a problem. But if we don't have enough carbon in the atmosphere, we better make darn sure that we get it locked into our soil where it's supposed to be. So we can keep more of that carbon down in our soils by fostering more diversity. Add more diverse plants above ground, pumps more diverse carbon compounds into the ground, feeds more diverse microbial systems. They do more diverse function. And we just bridge that to put money in their own pocket, right? One of the things that we love on our farm is relay cropping. And that's what this is. So we've got our cereal rye out there in the fall, our grass, we plant our legume cover crop into it in the spring. And instead of terminating or instead of crimping, we let it keep on growing. And we take the combine out there in July and harvest the rye over the top of the soybeans to relay crop. Now you gotta have a moisture to be able to do this. But we learned that the hard way here this year. Uh, total in growing season, I had six inches of rain, which I know I can't complain. Again, this won't work here. So you guys, six inches is like great, right? <laughs> if you found definitely something to try, if you've got the rain, if you've got the moisture, or if you can supplement it, and you can grow both these crops together, what we're seeing is allowing for that ride to now be a cash crop rather than be a cover crop. But I still got to make take big soybean yield because my land costs five hundred dollars per acre per year. I've got to be creative to make sure that I've got the money from the end to cover some of those fixed costs uh, for the land up I killed years ago. Sure, here's a relay crop to be able to do it. Can harvest the rye over the top of the soybeans, plus come back later in the year <laughs> and harvest the soybeans. Now this is solid seeded rye, solid seeded drilled soybeans. Okay, you can see we're running over with fat tire on the combine. Got a drink reheader to be able to harvest this. We're just going right over the top of your soybeans, harvesting them that rye, and then come back later and harvest the soybeans. On average, like 30 bushel acre rye, it's nothing crazy, but using VNS, but using LY, variety of things. So, trying to figure out how do we get more of this cover crop seed, um, but you know, and grow up some of it on our own and being able to figure out how do we, uh, we can't grow all of this stuff, right? We're buying a lot of our legumes, buying our vetch and different mixes to blend with this, but taking where it looks good, we're taking some of this all the way into harvest. Now, of course, you can't do this with hybrid rye and things like that, right? You gotta use open pollinated. NS or other varietals, but it's something that's worked really, really well for us. So you harvest right over the top of the beans. If you were in a, a twin row system or a 30 inch system, you could push the beans down and harvest a little bit lower. You kind of see, we, we miss a couple of the of the seed heads, right? That's fine. We get some spindly ones out there. That's no problem, but we harvest right over the top. Don't necessarily get all of them, which is fine. They'll reseed. They'll be out there in the fall. No problem. We're going to play for rye ahead of the uh, future corn anyway. A lot of times we'll go in and make, just put in our, our small seeds, uh, the legumes and the brassicas and stuff like that because we got plenty of rye out there already. We don't want to clip these beans. We're harvesting right over the top. But what we're doing here is we're messing with the photo period on these soybeans. So the most important thing in real life cropping is super full season soybeans. The rule of thumb is to use a mature, a full maturity group longer than normal. So for my operation, in my neck of the woods, southeast Iowa, we're typically a two-eight to a three-four maturity soybean, and in relay cropping, we're doing three-eighths, four-ups. Okay, this got full maturity or longer than what we normally would. And the reason for that, we plant our soybeans early, our rye is small, we're using relatively light rates of cereal rye, so that we still have some sunlight getting down in there. That's really been the key to make this work for us. And planting rain, we're using light rates of rye. 
light rates are coming up. Take let some sunlight get up in there, have plenty of space for the rye and our calf crop to grow together. So we plant early, and then when we terminate, or when we harvest that rye in July, we want those soybeans to still be in vegetated mode. Because now, they've got more sunlight, we just harvested that canopy off of the top of them, they say, hey, we got sunlight, we're in vegetated mode, let's rock and roll. And they branch out, and they do awesome, and we've been averaging 70 bushel beans, three quarters of a bushel of yield loss to our normal soybean yields in our trials. Pretty awesome. The problem can be if you don't use full enough maturity soybeans and you harvest the rye over the top, now the beans go, what just happened? The sunlight's different. I used to have some shade, sunlight, foot appearance different. And they are in, re if they're in reproductive mode already, they say, well, it's weird. We're in reproductive mode. We got to set these pods and call our neck. And they never grow to be higher than the canopy and the yield is terrible. So I um, kind of have super full season soybeans and uh, again by letting the rye and the beans grow together really get this symbiotic relationship to work what's amazing with this one of the big coolest things that we found in doing this relay system is we are forcing the soybeans to work harder for us <laughs> yes the soybeans got a rough out here in nebraska this come from the hora farm over at south east iowa they get planted early into cold wet soils into cereal rye they have to grow with that cereal rye for so multiple bites. They get no fertilizer, no seed treatment, no pesticide, nothing. We plant naked soybeans into rye, and then they got to figure it out on their own. They sink or swing. That we're drilling in like 160,000 seeds per acre, because we had to run some of them over, and it's a drill, right? It's a controlled spill, and don't all plant, they don't all, all uh, germinate and get going. But what's amazing is those beans in that rye, they are forced to figure it out. That rye has sucked up all the excess nitrogen that was out there in that soil or kind of a closed hall. But those beans have no opportunity to be lazy. They have to pump more carbon in the ground to get more of that rhizobial bacteria to colonize their roots, to get more nitrogen for themselves because the rye has taken everything that was available. So those beans are getting more of that carbon in your ground, getting more nodulation, the worst quantifying them with the Haney test that next spring, all the way up to a 200 unit nitrogen credit that following spring. The rule of thumb I was, I was taught over at Iowa State, um, just probably a bad word right here, but yeah. at Iowa State, they teach us that soybeans fix and we'll give a credit about one pound of nitrogen per bushel, right? In this system, we're saying we can do 70 bushel beans, and upwards of a 200 pound match of credit, more than two pounds of match per bush. But it's because we're messing with that photo period, right? That surreal rise has seen that ratio close to 50 to one or so, probably. And those beans, how to figure out how to get their own nitrogen because those microbes are taking all of it out of the soil. So getting those, those, nodule, those nodules to really rock and roll, set this up for success the following year, like a big opportunity to utilize that soybean as part of that nitrogen system for the following. <laughs> part of it is we're using super full season soybeans, right? So I don't have a lot of opportunity to get really diverse cover crop cocktails in there by the time I harvest soybeans late, I want to plant my cover crop ahead of my corn. So we're using the soybean and the rye growing together as part of that multi-year system of enabling diversity getting that soil organic nitrogen built up. We got one credit the following year. But the key in this, and you got, if you want to quantify that nutrient availability, you got to use something like a heating test that quantifies the organic nitrogen. Because the nitrogen that's available that following year, it's not nitrate and ammonium. It's in the organic nitrogen form. So be sure to keep that in mind if you want to see where you're getting on the other farm. Then we go out there, we're harvesting that rye, we're harvesting the soybeans, we got a bunch of uh, straw out there, right? Because we harvest that rye in July, there's still a lot of straw, so that draper had this really helped out, but seeing really, really awesome yields. Uh, certain in different zones, you can get federal crop insurance for this as well. Talk with your with your rep. Some of the, you don't gotta, don't do this on a thousand acres, right? Do this small scale, something that uh, I do believe can be a really, really interesting opportunity uh, for our operations. Integrate the livestock. We definitely uh, have all going 
on our farm, but for a lot of you guys find a better opportunity to be able to get this done. But I think we got to also think about not just that above ground livestock, that would be amazing to get out there, right? Mimicking mother nature, mimicking the buffalo and those critters roaming the prairie. But also I think it's about getting all those other critters to go as well. The rest of that soul food web, those beetles, the different critters that can also get us good positive outcomes. For quads, I think things like earthworm activity and stuff, we've got different researchers come out, they get opportunity there, but also opportunity to make sure that we're factoring in some of those beneficial insects, other beneficial microorganisms as well. Um, but opportunity, of course, to get that livestock back out there wherever we possibly can to be able to get that manure, that urine, the saliva out there to really film start the system. We absolutely could go further, faster on our operation if we had livestock. Um, we've been able to be pretty successful without it, but it absolutely is an opportunity to go to the next level, to go even further than before. Oh, maybe a pause there. How are we doing our other fire? Let's get a break him. Any questions on that before I turn into how do we take this frame and make some extra money on it? Yes, sir. So you relay crop and you added the Buddhist lead to a farm bean, corn bean, and Iowa. Yep. Did you implement it? Were you all? Yep. Great question. So asking about, uh, you know, it's more diversity, right? It's only one more species of variety, right? That much diversity would be outplayed with a variety, wide array of other things. I've done it with wheat before. Um, they, we have on our cover crop side of things, we've used more than 25 different species of covers, right? Inner seed, 60 inch corn, all this stuff, right? You can really get creative. <laughs> but we've done the relay cropping mostly with rye because of the height differential. Okay, so I've got drilled soybeans and solid seeded rye. Um, those beans in July, they're getting big, right? So I planted them in mid early April. So those beans are getting big. The problem where we have relay cropped wheat. A wheat is just short, just short enough in July that those beans are getting up there and it's really tough to harvest the wheat heads over the top of the soybean with enough clearance that we're not just clipping soybeans. So that's been the problem there. I think the wheat, barley, trip, some of these other things, that's where a twig row system, if we had twig row cereal in the fall, maybe 30 inch beans of twin row beans, now you could have them spaced differently and it's a pusher or a row crop head to push that soybean down just a little bit, be able to harvest a little bit lower. I think there's opportunities there. Probably opportunities for other species too, not just like one single species grass that one single species legume, but a lot of other things that could be relay cropped or blended together, grown together, chickpeas and flax, things like that. I got customers doing things like that. You could really get creative, I think, with some of these blends, some of these cocktails, whether you harvest them separately or harvest them together and then separate, clean out that seed later. Depends on what your use is, right? Depends on what your market's going to be. Depends on how you're going to utilize this stuff. But um, we have a uh, quick story on that. We, we did some relay cropping where I had 60 inch corn and in our system was 16 inch corn. We've actually added skip row corn, plant two, skip one. So it's two rows on and about 50,000 plants per acre in the row and every third row off. So I've still got about 34,000 plants per acre. And then we fly on or intercede diversity cover crop cocktail, especially out over that 60 inch gap to really be able to get that diversity going. Playing you know, like nine, 10, 12 species, all kinds of different stuff. Cause now in 60 inch corn, you can, you got a bigger window to intercede. Cause you've got that space. You can plant those diverse cocktails, not impede your corn as much cause you've got a bit of a window there. And you got a little bit more flexibility on being able to plant that cover crop because you got more sunlight penetration. So it really opens up that opportunity, especially if you've got livestock. I think wide row corn, getting that diverse cocktail out there can really be something beneficial. And in our plant two skip one system, I did it for three years. We showed, we showed no yield loss in that system because I still have the same amount of plants per acre, but I just had to be two rows instead of all three air seed of that cover in there and uh, indexing the fertilizer to the row, right? But able to see maintain yield. If you do straight up 60 inch corn every other row, on average, we're seeing about 10 to 15% yield loss. 
but you can have your diverse cover cod cocktail in there, get massive biomass in a, in a 60 inch row corn system, and more than make up from the yield loss with the amount of forage and grace on to me. So huge uh, thing that I really think uh, something to consider here. Where I was going with that story is we had this diverse cover cod cocktail out there that we interceded into 16 inch corn. I did drill a little bit more cereal rye because rye doesn't necessarily like being planted out there in June, right? Rye is cold season grass, doesn't necessarily like being planted out there. So we, we seeded in a little bit more rye in the fold because I wanted to have that cover to suppress weeds, a consistent cover crop out there to plant my soybeans into the next year. The rye was looking really good, so we did not terminate the rye the next year. Instead, we harvested it, the real I cropped it. But because I had that diverse cover crop cocktail out there, I had all kinds of stuff growing. We had hairy vetch that went to seed. We had uh, rape seed that went to seed. I had eagle rye that went to seed. And we harvested that over the top of those beans. We had all kinds of stuff in there uh, that we harvested all of it together. We were just using it for our own cover crop seed purposes. So we harvested all this stuff, put it in the bin, and then we went out there and seeded it. So there is opportunity for some of this, but on those crops, of course, we left a lot of seed out there in the field just because that height differential on those soybeans. But anyway, <laughs> uh, on our farm, we've also, we have done some winter uh, malt barley. Works pretty well. A winter uh, winter malt barley, we've done mustard. Um, we've done mustard for seed. We've done an open pollinated corn, uh, bloody butcher and, and lemon drop, uh, some heritage corn. Um, and this is on wheat, rye, barley, mustard. Mostly keep it to the corn soybeans, right? My markets, corn and soybeans, as far as the eye can see, right? But getting some of that rye out there, being able to grow some rye covers, I think can really be an interesting opportunity. And then we're collaborating now with those uh, seed dealers, um, being able to, to grow seed uh, for mm-hmm. for some of our local dealers and stuff. They can they can go and, and market it to their customers. We also got another question or two on the. And care farm set of things. Where was it? Go ahead, set. Uh, so on the harvesting side of it, when you're harvesting over the fall, are you seeing any more maintenance costs with because uh, you're putting so much more stuff through the harvester? Yeah, I think definitely. Um, and so this question being on maintenance costs and stuff like that, right? So the one cha- one of the only changes that we've made in our system since so really going down this regenerative route is getting that draper out instead of a regular soybean your know, auger head platform. Then the reason that draper is really great is when we're harvesting the rye over the top of the beans, there's only a little bit of rest, only a little bit of material coming through so that we drive a little bit faster to keep it seen in quicker. And that draper head conveyor belt in that material in a more consistent manner works pretty well. When we're harvesting the beans, we have a lot of material out there. So we drive slower. Now that rye is really brilliant. That, um, I mean, we killed it in Everybody was harvested in July, and it was dying off before that. And our microbial system really cranking. So that rye is super brittle. We really not have any issues with it going through. But uh, in its light rates, right? So in that relay system, I only planted about a bushel of rye per acre. So it's not like I've got two bushel worth of cereal rye straw out there. One bushel worth of rye straw feeding through that platform more consistently because of the drink we're headed, going slower being patient to be able to avoid issues that way. But we did a bunch of maintenance on the combine last year, uh, which is part of it. Um, but uh, I think going slower, being patient. But yeah, I mean, maintenance is definitely gonna be one of the things. We also, one of our other changes that we made was we used to seed all of our cover crops with a drill in the fall. We were running that uh, Great Plains no-till drill out there on those corn stalks that were still really healthy corn stalks that were really chewing up that uh, drill. So we took, we had an old turbo till that was just sitting in the shed doing nothing. That was, it's the old turbo till that the gangs don't change pitch or nothing like that. And we rigged up a mod tag um, air system onto that turbo till. It's a two bin, 20, uh, 2208. So I could put cover crop in one bin, fertilizer in the other bin. We've got it plumbed up such that we could drop the fertilizer indexed right into where that corn row is gonna be. And we could spread the cover crop in the middle between the rows, or we can put cereal rye in both. We can drive it a hagel, then solid seed and cereal rye, uh, soybeans. 
So that turbo till works a lot better, more robust piece of machinery than just the drill. Keep the drill for use in the spring, because uh, again, yes, yeah, so that running the equipment across the fields definitely no wear is over time. Yes, sir. So is uh, one bushel of rye per acre a low rate for you then? So the question be a one bushel of rye is at a low rate. Um, I think we'll go even lower than that. Um, the type foreign, we'll go 35 pounds of rye. If we're going really early, maybe we'll blend in some other stuff. I like rye and wheat or just use wheat ahead of corn because it's not as aggressive. Maybe a couple of pounds of hairy vetch. Uh, rape seeds worked really well for us and then we'll overwinter. So we're blending in some other things where we use those light rates. Um, but we're playing the light rates, especially earlier in the fall. As we get later in the fall, we build it up to go a little bit heavier. We don't necessarily ever get over about 70 pounds of rye is the most that we would go. But again, in our system, we're planting our cash crop into it early corn or soybean when it's relatively small, and then we're waiting to terminate until later. So I don't want this super thick mat of cover out there. If I was going to try to roller crimp more of that cover, I definitely have to have a heavier rate. If I was in an organic system or something like that and wanted even more point suppression, I'd go a heavier rate. I would look for our system, 45 to 60 pounds is usually where we are. But again, it'd be based on moisture, based on how early are we planting, and go a little bit heavier rates to get later in the fall. I'm <laughs> it's a real point your operation when you plant treat your soybean seed. Let's wait up. We don't treat anything right now. Is there a point when you started to do it as a head or? Um, good question. So a question on the uh, treat and soybean seed. We have been doing it probably uh, seven, eight, nine years. It was pretty early on that we got rid of the uh, the seed treatment. Now, for the most part, though, but we've been no on soybeans since the 80s, right? So we've been kind of building up that system for a long time. Um, and now pretty used to just making soybean seed. Um, but I really like, you know, I, I would say play with it. Right? I wouldn't just cut all this stuff right in year one, but probably by year three or so, especially if we're planting beans into the rye, we're utilizing that rye to manage the soil moisture. Usually we're using seed treatments because we're planting early, we're worried about sudden death and pithium and these kind of things, but I'm letting that cover crop maintain the moisture and soil temperature for me. So over time, we get more and more comfortable right, without using the seed treatment utilize the rye itself. Now, if you got farms that have really bad disease problems, of course, don't just cut it right away. But a lot of the seed treatments and their fungicides and stuff, they're killing a lot more than just the bad guys. They're killing a lot of the good guys too, hindering our crop's ability to interact with these soil microorganisms. So I think as we're gonna build up our soil health over time, we've gotta allow for that natural system to work in symbiosis together, coming back as we go. But so not necessarily year one, but we did pretty early. You know, go for it. You talked about it. Plank two, skip a row. Yeah. You know, and, and cup of crops. It would best twin row belongs to the cup of crops. Yeah, we did twin row core. As a question made on twin row versus like the skip row stuff. We did some twin row um, back a, a while back. Um, I don't know, probably 10, 12 years ago, we had a, a twin row planter. I've never done it with 60 in corn. So when we got into cover crops, we didn't have the twin row planter anymore. And I do think that'd be an awesome opportunity, though, especially in that skip row system where uh, those plants could be a little bit more spread out because if you're going to go 60 inch corn or plant two skip one you're putting a lot of plants together in a small area so in a twin row system you can spread them out just a little bit again i think that's where you could use a twin row system or like a dual scene kind of thing to twin row you know, cereal in the fall the twin row your soybeans in the spring being able to give them a little bit more room to look and then we relay those together definitely think there's some opportunity there just for our operation, we haven't done a lot of it. To be honest, we're, we're not doing a lot of skip rail corn here anymore. Do not have livestock on my operation? We were seeing incredible uh, nutrient cycling gains and nutrient availability and soil health gains. But in order to really capitalize on it, what I would need to do is because I'm doing plant two, skip one, I've got basically 45 inches between the skip rail where I've got amazing diverse cover crops. And to capitalize on that, I should do corn like corn or crazy. I don't necessarily want to do corn or in a corn soybean rotation. And I don't have the livestock be able to get out there and graze. We're looking at being able to fly bring some more neighbors where they can run cattle or a different young producer where they can have an opportunity. But in order to really capitalize on that diverse cover crop cocktail, I should do corn on corn where I've got twin row corn over here, cover crop cocktail in the middle, 
And then the next year, it moved that twin row corn over here, put the Kumquat cocktail back on this gap. That would be the opportunity to be able to really maximize that uh, system if you work in a livestock scenario, but for our farm doing a corn swigging rotation. So haven't any pushed out too much. It's a, um, uh, the hold up just being, or just, it's what we've always done, right? Corn swigging rotation. You ever heard that before? Um, but, uh, but I mean, I want the, so part of it being working, so we like the relay crop, right? I'm using that soybean gear with the cover crop in it to really fix a lot of nitrogen. So instead of doing the corn on corn, white row stuff, uh, we're using that, the soybean gear in there. We're also using that soybean and big cereal rye year to really suppress a lot of weeds as well. If you're going to skip row corn, you're interceding, you got to change your herbicide program, right? Can't necessarily be spraying uh, if you got weed escapes and stuff. So I still like to have a little bit of that rotation out there uh, to be able to get suppressed weeds, not get too much disease built up, avoiding some of these other things we work so hard to cut back on those inputs for. But um, I definitely think it could work in a couple of year type of system where, especially if you've got livestock to be able to graze a little bit, you can get a lot of mess out there and really get more diversity in that system too. Or if you want to jumpstart your soil health system, you can do some of that, but again, you got to change your your pesticide program. So you want to do it where you don't necessarily have any <laughs> issues already. Um, and my other piece of advice is some of these soil health things, I think we, we sometimes go a little bit too bullheaded into, but we definitely catch ourselves on that as well, right? We get a little too stubborn, not that farmers would ever do that. Sometimes we get a little too stubborn and really we should cut our losses once in a while. If we got some of these issues, like in the insecticide thing I, I talked about, yeah, we don't want to use insecticides and all. We're killing a lot of good guys in the end, bad guys, but sometimes we're going to cover losses and live to fight the other day. Same thing in some of these interceded cocktails and stuff. I've seen guys just get annihilated with weeds, and now you've got huge problems for the next five, seven, ten years because you just had all this water hemp that went to seed. Now you're going to have massive problems for years to come. So sometimes you got to cover losses live to find another day, but let it get built up over time and utilize some of these basic principles first, like cereal rye and the soybeans, <laughs> get those weed banks worked out, and then you can get more aggressive over the years. So how much rain do you get in here? In our neck of which we're in a 35 inch system is what we're, we're technically at. Last year at six inches so. So we see a big diverse of it, but yeah, in our zone, we're 35 inches south. So a good chunk of that come in in the winter as snow, and then the uh, rest of it in the spring. So we're doing irrigation, completely reliant on Mother Nature. Um, and our soils are really spread all over the place. So I've got some soils that are 1% organic matter, all the way up to 6.5%. In Iowa, we have CSRs for corn suitability rating, or that's a productivity index. It ranges from 0 to 100. 100 being the best soils to produce corn, Zero being the worst, right? Our farm, our soil types, we range from a CSR of five to a hundred. We got a lot of diversity in that uh, system. So just for a little context, but yeah, when we get rain, this stuff works awesome. Again, where we don't have the rain, we also need to not be so stubborn on forcing some of these big covers to work. We need to lift to find another day. Last year kind of bit us in the butt. We did a lot of relay crop. We did more than we'd ever done. More than about 50% of our soybean acres we relay crop. The rye was awesome. Did our best yield ever on the rye, but we had no moisture hardly at all out there, and it really dinged our soybean yields. They still had done doing, I think, out like 52, <laughs> but um, 52, but usually we are looking at 70, 80, right? No, I can't complain, but I'm gonna. <laughs> I wanted 70 bushel beans. I don't think I have 50 chug. But, um, but the point being is, even even in our system, as we're trying to be really aggressive on this, I think we've got to let Mother Nature speak to us here once in a while, too, um, and not be so stubborn. Something that we, we definitely have to do in our farm. And um, he told, yeah, can we bother? Yeah. Can be patient. You got another one back here. Yeah, I'm going to let the take it. Only means it really late. He went south. Go be right by this one. Yeah, great question. So let's talk about lankiness of the beans, the region, or like definitely a risk. But what we found is, again, we're using light rates of rye. So if we call a little cup of rye, the beans are usually around that 45 pound range. 
and a real crop will lay out 60, 65 bucks. Not that heavy of a rate. We're using Alpon Rye. It's a little bit more upright stature, smaller, narrower leaves, a little bit more upright stature, let a little bit more sunlight get down in there. We'll plant these beans really early too. So that rye is spark. We're gonna plant the beans so they can get up and go. Those bottom inner nodes are definitely elongated. Usually the bottom one, two, three inner nodes are a little bit elongated. Those beans reaching a little bit, but they get up, they get some of that sunlight. We're seeing them really stack nodes after that. But I think the light rates of cover crop early planted beans the full season beans that helps us to not get too lanky and just fall over and have a mess um definitely a concern though but i think those those races that we've been able to avoid too much issue go for it how many years of care system did it take to get to your current reduced synthetic fertilized rates yeah great question how many years did it take to get it to reduce we started really able to come back after year three and year four not necessarily right away and i think a lot of times we get super hyped up there's something saying so watch too much youtube right and then we want to just cut right away and do all this crazy stuff it takes a little bit of patience okay one of the things that we saw with the amy test is really what I, I like to use to monitor that is the organic nutrient cycling is really what starts to flourish right away even as early as year one especially with rye and soybeans even as early as year one we can get more organic digestion built up we can get more liquid carbon a water check organic carbon we can get more biological activity or we can start cycling more nitrogen especially in the organic form as early as year one then potassium we thought comes later phosphorus has been the toughest one to really be able to unlock and get to cycle more because of those chemical bonds in the soil but especially yeah year three year four year five that's when we started cutting back i think in part of this stuff guys we've got to Make sure that we don't, again, throw the system out of whack. Sometimes we're kind of in the great end system to begin with, right? So we've got to baby step into this stuff a little bit. Can it over time experiment and come back over time? So what we do is we run different rates, right? Run the full rate versus a 75% rate versus a 50% rate and see how far back can we pull it. Not just because the data says we can pull back, but use the data plus those field trials to let your system tell you how much nutrient it actually needs. But to experiment, pull back slowly over time, go for it. Uh, again, and kind of following that, what a form of nitrogen will keep using and now what job will taste the out in and what's on it. So now I'd really like to see some of my sins over here of being sad and being patient on some of this. We're still using some fallen hackers. It's cool. Yeah. One of the worst things we can do for soil health Besides, use fun actors with a match pyron would be worse because uh, it's literally bacterial aside. We cut our, our anhydrous by about 50% and we don't apply anything until that soil is cold and in late November. But it's absolutely killing a bunch of those microbes out there. I know it. Now, we're trying to do more good than bad. Anhydrous, bad. Roundup, literally a white shirt bacterial aside. That's the patent mode. <laughs> Fungicide, seed germ, that's all these things. Bad, bad, bad. But still in a conventional system okay we're not going to the complete extreme trying to get there over time so that fallen hydrogen is cut by more than 50 percent playing with a polymer some of these different things to lessen the negative impact in the spring we do a little bit of liquid 32 percent with that roundup burn down after we plant we can citrus liquid 32 percent in season play around with ams as well as we should get some sulfur out there with some nitrogen but not a little bit in furrow with the planter use a lot of biological nitrogen fixer and stuff as well uh, we can spread a little bit of urea if we need can band on a little bit of map if we need uh but for the most part yeah cutting back on those uh on that and hydrous and said i'm split six would love to be able to get fully away from that go to full liquid type stuff one of the things we've really got to get figured out all our operation again it's one of those things what we've always done all right one Probably, you know, number one. But what we're doing is we plant our cover crop out there and then look as early as we can in the fall, knife in that anhydrous, and then we're planting directly on that anhydrous knife. So it's kind of a little bit of a strip till where I've got a tiny little band where I can plant my corn onto that knife, but do it in the fall so it's letting that soil mellow back out and seal up some of those air pockets and stuff. And definitely a no no. Would love to, I 100% see us getting fully away from it. It's just we're on this journey, right? 
long journey. We've cut our nitrogen by nearly you know, 75 to 50%, but uh, we still got work to do.